Chapter 4 Spiritual Ministration Completion of Yoga Tapas On the day following his attainment of Siddhi of the Southern Direction, the attainment of Deek Siddhi of all four directions by the Bali Yogi was celebrated by ceremoniously breaking 1008 coconuts in each direction. The ceremony commenced at 7 a.m. and was completed by midnight. When it was over, the Bali Yogi broke his mauna by melodiously chanting the Omkar Shabd. The next day at midnight, the Divine Guru again appeared. As the Bali Yogi had been observing mauna since 29th October 1953, he had only been able to converse with his Guru in sign language so far. Now that he had broken his mauna, he could converse with him more freely and easily. That apart, up to now, the Bali Yogi had been completely absorbed in his tapas, to the exclusion of everything else. Therefore, neither had any doubt arisen in his mind about the true identity of his Guru, nor had it ever crossed his mind to question him about it. As we had mentioned earlier, when the Divine Guru appeared before him on that fateful day of 7th August 1949, the Bali Yogi had taken him to be a Sadguru of the Jangam Devar sect, and he continued to hold on to this belief throughout these first eight years of his tapas, i.e. up to May 1957, when he attained the Siddhi of all the four directions. But now a doubt arose in his mind as regards to the real identity of his Guru, and he proceeded to question him about it. Bali Yogi, who are you? What is your true identity? Divine Guru, don't you know who I am? Bali Yogi says, No, I don't. I am further perplexed by your behavior and your appearance. You suddenly materialize before me as if out of thin air, and just as suddenly you disappear again. That apart, in your features and to all other respects, you look exactly like Shankar Bhagavan. The only differences that I can see between you and Bhagavan are that Shankar Bhagavan has a snow-white complexion, whereas you are dark. And whereas there is stages or luminosity emanating from Shankar Bhagavan, there is no such stages emanating from you. I find this quite mystifying and hence I doubt a doubt has arisen in my mind about your actual identity. Divine Guru said with an amused smile, After all that I have done for you, do you still have doubt? All right, I will clear your doubt after you complete the full twelve years of your Yoga Tapas. As there were still four years left for completion of the Yoga Tapas, the Divine Guru directed the Bali Yogi to do tapas for this remaining period, facing the east. He also told the Bali Yogi that from now on, he could start in, uh, initiating aspirants into Dhyana, and that he need not continue his uh, present practice of remaining in Samadhi for all the 24 hours. Just 12 hours a day would suffice. In accordance with the above directions of his Guru, the Bali Yogi now started adhering to the following daily routine. From 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. he did Dhyan, during which period he was mostly in Samadhi. From 4 p.m. to midnight he gave Darshan to devotees. During this period Kirtan was also organized at the Dhyana Mandir. From midnight to 1 a.m. He, he attended to his ablutions and had his daily bath. From 1 to 3 a.m. he would rest. So far, the Bali Yogi had restricted his diet to consuming a measured quantity of milk once every day after his midnight bath. He now started partaking of a milk and fruit diet twice a day, once at 3 a.m. before sitting for dhyana and a second time at 4 p.m. when he got up from dhyana. As hitherto, the serpents continued to favor the Bali Yogi with, his, with their attention. One night during this period, a snake entered the dhyana mandir while the Bali Yogi was in samadhi. Apparently, through the water outlet and bit him on the hand tearing away a bit of the flesh in the process. The Bali Yogi only became aware of this when he got up from Samadhi and found that his hand was bleeding, bleeding profusely. However, he suffered no ill effects from this bite. From the earliest days of commencement of tapas, people used to come to Adivara Pupeta in large numbers for the darshan of the Bali Yogi. And now that he had started giving public darshan, the stream became a flood and an ever-increasing number of people started thronging the Dhyana Mandir for the daily darshan and kirtan. The Bali Yogi always derived special satisfaction from feeding people. 
Consequently, at his behest, mass feeding of the devotees and the poor was organized regularly every day on 24th January, Baliyogi's birthday, on Mahashivratri, and on August, 7th August, the date of commencement of the tapas, and on many other occasions in between. Like the darshan and the kirtan, mass feeding had also become a regular feature of the activities surrounding the Baliyogi from the very earliest days of his tapas. The tapas and spiritual ministration continued side by side for the next three and a half years, and soon time turned the corner to the year 1961. On 7th August of this year, the Bali Yogi would complete the full 12 years of his Yoga Tapas. Siddhi of Yoga Tapas From about January 1961, the Bali Yogi started losing inclination for even the very restricted diet of milk and fruit that he was having. First the fruit were deleted and then he, and he reverted back to his original pure milk diet and gradually even this was reduced and soon he had restricted himself to con consuming an occasional glass of milk often only after an interval of many days. On most days he merely drank some water when he went to the well for his daily midnight bath and apparently this seemed to suffice. At the same time the period of samadhi began to increase again. Around the beginning of June 1961 the Bali Yogi became absorbed in continuous Nirvikalpa Samadhi, which lasted an unbroken, unbroken for full two months, i.e. for the whole of June and July 1961. At midnight of the 1st of August 1961, the Divine Guru came and aroused the Bali Yogi from his deep Samadhi. When he saw that the Bali Yogi had returned to normal consciousness, the Divine Guru smiled and said, you had a doubt about my true identity, didn't you? All right, now watch closely. As he said those words, a dazzling light, like lightning, flashed forth from the Guru's body. And instead of the dark-hued Jangam Deva, there stood before him the snow-white and bewitching form of his Ishta Dev, Shankar Bhagavan. It was thus revealed to the Bali Yogi that his Guru had been none other than Shankar Bhagavan himself who used to come and guide him in the guise of a Jankam Deva. Having cleared the Bali Yogi's doubt on this point, Shankar Bhagavan and Mother Parvati, who had been accompanying him, sat on the Dhyana platform and began to converse affectionately with the Bali Yogi, whom they looked upon as their disciple and their child. Shankar Bhagavan told the Bali Yogi that his period of tapas was over and he was now free to roam at will and act as it pleased him. You may go wherever you like and do whatever you wish to, said the Bhagavan. To this, the Bali Yogi replied that he had no wish to go anywhere nor do anything in particular. Do you have a wish in mind, Shambhu then inquired. You may ask for anything and it shall be granted to you. Again, the Bali Yogi replied that he desired nothing at all and that he could do whatever Shankar, he would do whatever Shankar Bhagavan wanted him to do. Well pleased with this answer, Shankar Bhagavan complimented the Bali Yogi on his steadfastness in tapas and then told him that henceforth his mission would be to rouse the dormant spirituality of the people in general and to help sadhakas, aspirants, who were struggling on the spiritual path to gain liberation from the yoke of samsara. To this end, he should travel around and give darshan to people. Such darshan would help in weaning them away from the materialistic to the spiritual path. He should initiate aspirants into the secret and mystic path of Dhyana Yoga and guide them so that they are able to gain liberation in this very life. He should give solace to those who grieved and heal those who suffered from myriad afflic afflictions of the mind and the body. This process of healing would be effected by giving the sufferers sacred vibhuti, which would be blessed and consecrated by him for, for this purpose. Shankar Bhagavan then told the Bali Yogi that henceforth he should use the name Shiva Bali Yogi Shwara. Bala means uh, is another name for Mother Parvati, so the name signified the Lord of Yogis devoted to Shiva and Parvati. Later, the Bali Yogi on his own changed the name given to him by Shiva to Shiva Bali Yogi Maharaj, as he felt that the use of the title Yogeshwar in the name might be misunderstood by many to imply that he was being equated with Ishvara, the Supreme Lord. Finally, Shankar Bhagavan told his disciple that he would make him sit in tapas from time to time as the need arose in the future.
then giving their blessings and bidding an affectionate farewell, Shankar and Bhavani disappeared. It is significant that Sri Shivabali Yogi Maharaj from that day uh, started exhibiting in his own body the Ardhanari Swarasarup, i.e. one half of his body showed the characteristics of a man and the other half had many characteristics peculiar to a woman, thus signifying in his own person the union of Parvati and Parameshwara. As the day for completion of the Yuga, Yuga Tapas of the Bali Yogi drew near, thousands of people began streaming into Adivara Puketa for the darshan of the Yogi. By the morning of 7th August 1961, a vast crowd numbering well over 300,000 had assembled and in and around the Dhyana Mandir, and they waited in joyous expectation for the Yogi to emerge. At 8 that morning, the Bali Yogi or Sri 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 Shiva Bali Yogi Maharaj, as he was now named, marked the completion of the 12-year period of Yoga Tapas by chanting the Omkar Shabd in a melodious voice. The doors of the Dhyana Mandir were then thrown open, and he was escorted to a high wooden platform, which had been constructed spe especially for this occasion. As he emerged from the Dhyana Mandir, a mighty roar went up from the assembled multitude. Unused as he was to walking and considerably weakened by the lack of nourishment during the two-month-long Samadhi, Sri Shivabali Yogi Maharaj had to be helped onto the Darshan days. Then, as the yogi came into the full view of the vast assembly, thundering, thunderous cheering broke out, and the countryside reverberated with ecstatic Jai Jaikars that issued from the 300,000 throats. The adoration of his devotees nearly sent the yogi into samadhi again, and he had to be literally held up to prevent him from falling. Standing there with his eyes closed in a semi-conscious state of spiritual ecstasy, Sri Shiva Bali Yogi Maharaj silently showered his blessings on the people who had assembled for his darshan. As the crowd uh, pushed and jostled to get a closer view of the Mahatma, they saw standing before them a yogi whose body, though em emaciated and deformed by the rigors of his intense tapas, nevertheless shone with a strange luster and visibly exuded peace and spiritual grace. The point of digression, the term Ardhana Rishwara means half god, half goddess form. This is one of the forms of Shankar, in which one half of his body appears as Shiva and the other half as Parvati. This form signifies the union of Parvati and Parameshwar, i.e. the Supreme Lord and his Shakti. Continuing, the establishment of the Adi Ashram. After the completion of the Yuga Tapas, Sri Shivabali Yogi Maharaj felt no immediate inclination to go anywhere, and he continued to reside for the time being at Adivara Pupeta. The work of spiritual ministration, which had commenced immediately after the Yogi attained the Siddhi of the Four Directions in May 1957, now acquired added impetus as people began coming for the Yogi's darshan in ever increasing numbers. A need soon was soon felt to organize a proper ashram, so the area surrounding the Dhyana Mandir was acquired. A compound wall built, and thus a regular ashram came into being. This is now the Adi Ashram of the Sri 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 Shivabali Yogi Maharaj Trust. An ashram committee was also formed, which was made responsible for organizing the daily darshan, kirtan, dhyana, diksha, and other ashram activities. The, propit the propitiating of Raktakali. On 19th January 1962, a family from Rajamundri came for the darshan of Sri Swamiji. They brought along with them their teenage daughter, aged about 18 years, who appeared to be in a trance-like state. The parents explained to Sri Swamiji that their daughter was an ardent devotee of Mother Kali and that lately she had been keeping upas or total abstention from food as a part of her worship of the mother. A day or so earlier, the girl suddenly went into trance and started asking for blood to quench her thirst. Naturally, the strange behavior of their daughter frightened the parents, and so they brought the girl to Sri Swamiji. While the parents were explaining all this to Sri Swamiji, the girl sat quietly, reclining against the wall, 
at the back. All of a sudden, like one jolted by an electric current, the girl was jerked into an erect posture. Like, then like one possessed, she started grinding her teeth in a violent and frightening manner and swinging her body from side to side. It was apparent from her behavior that she had lost her normal consciousness and had become totally unaware of her surroundings. As she obviously appeared to be possessed by possessed, a devotee sitting nearby asked her who she was. In a thundering voice, she replied, I will not tell. Who are you? When the devotee concerned announced his own identity, the girl stated that she was Somalamma, known as Shyamalamba of Rajamundri, that she had now come as Raktakali, that she would first devour herself and then kill the people of Adivara Pupeta, including the Swamiji, then she would devastate the whole country. Only thus would her present consuming thirst for blood be satisfied. Sri Shivabali Yogi Maharaj, who had been watching and listening uh, quietly all the while, now addressed Raktakali in the person of the girl. He assured her that he would give her all the blood she required to quench her thirst, so she should leave the devotees alone and come to him. He then extended his left arm for Raktakali to slake her thirst. With a vicious smile, Raktakali seized his arm and bit into the extended palm of his hand. Blood spurted out from the palm, and Raktakali began to suck it greedily as though she was tormented by an insatiable thirst. This blood drinking went on for almost two hours, and all this while Sri Swamiji quietly continued to converse with her. In reply to one of his questions, Raktakali said that his blood was sweet as nectar, and that she had quenched her thirst for the next two thousand years. Finally, Raktakali appeared satisfied and uh, and was pleased. She blessed sweet Sri Swamiji, bestowed all her powers on him, and took her leave. Immediately after this, the girl became her normal self again. Stapana of Shivalinga At the behest of the devotees, Sri Swamiji agreed to install a Shivalinga and an icon of Mother Parvati in the Dhyana Mandir to commemorate according to religious tradition, the place where he had done his tapasya. Soon after this decision was taken, a beautiful Shivalinga appeared before Sri Swamiji in his Dhyana. It was simultaneously revealed to him that this was the Shivalinga meant for installation in the Dhyana Mandir and that it would be found in the Narmada River near the Sangam or confluence that adjoins the famous Omkareshwar temple. On the basis of this revelation, Sri Swamiji briefed two devotees, Gauri Shankar and Satyanarayan Reddy, on how and where to find the Shivalinga and dispatched them to the Narmada River with instructions to locate the Shivalinga and bring it back with them. In spite of an intense search, these devotees could not find a Shivalinga conforming to the description given by Sri Swamiji, and so they were compelled to return empty-handed. When these devotees failed to find the Shivalinga, Sri Swamiji summoned Sadhu Narayan Das, an initiated disciple of Tapasvichi Maharaj. He gave him an exact description of the Shivalinga, and this time in order to ensure that Narayan Das would succeed in his mission, Sri Swamiji instructed him to sit in Dhyana on the banks of the Narmada opposite the Sangam near the Omkareshwar temple. Sri Swamiji assured Narayan Das that the location of the Shivalinga would be revealed to him in his Dhyana. With high hopes, Sadhu Narayan Das left for the Narmada river as instructed by Sri Swamiji, sat in Dhyana at the place he had indicated. Though he continued to sit for near Thus, for twenty days running, no revelation came, and he felt thoroughly dejected at the thought of having to go back without accomplishing his task. Rather than return empty-handed, he decided he would select a Shivalinga of his own choice and take it along as he went back. Looking around, he soon found a beautiful Shivalinga with a natural luster emanating from it, and so he picked it up to take back with him as a substitute for the one he failed to find. Though Sadhu Narayan Das was somewhat consoled at having found a good substitute, Shivalinga, the thought that he had failed to find the Shivalinga described by Sri Swamiji continued to weigh on his mind. This made him sad at heart. One night before he was due to leave, 
Sadhu Narayan Das felt restless and unhappy, so he strolled to the, uh, across to the spot where he had sat in dhyana all those days. The thought of his failure continued to press his mind, and he sat staring out at the river in a disconsolate mood. As he watched the dark rivers, or dark waters of the river tumbling and gurgling past, his mind soon became calm and peaceful, and he went into deep dhyan. Suddenly, he had a vision of the Jyoti, or light, and he felt that the Jyoti em was emerging from within him and lighting up the whole area around. Startled by this vision, he opened his eyes and saw that a ray of brilliant light was actually emanating from his forehead and was be being beamed toward the center of the river. Looking along this beam of light, Sadhu Narayan Das saw to his joy and wonder that the light was playing upon a beautiful Shivalinga that was bobbing up and down the water in the center of the river, reflecting back brilliant hues of silver and gold. With a throbbing heart, Sadhu Narayan Das waded out to the river, and though the Shivalinga was rather heavy, under normal circumstances at least two or three men were required to lift it. He found no difficulty in picking it up and bringing it out. Next day, with a joyful heart, he left for Adivara Pupeta with both the Shivalingas. The sacred Shivalinga uh, revealed to Sri Swamiji in his dhyana and found by Sa and, and found by Sadhu Narayan in this in mysterious elevating circumstances was installed by Sri Swamiji in the Dhyana Mandir on Mahashivaratri of 1962, 25th February 1962. He consecrated the Lingam by the power of his tapas, thus making it an awakened and living manifestation of the great God Shiva. The Swayambhu Linga, self-manifested Linga, also known as Atma Linga, had a silver sheen on one side and a golden sheen on the other. The silvery colouring is representative of the snow white complexion of Shiva and the golden colouring is representative of the golden complexion of Mother Parvati. Thus the Shiva Linga exhibits the Ardhanarishwara Swarup of Shankar Bhagavan. Installation of Parvati Murti While the search for the Shiva Linga was going on, an icon of Mother Parvati which had been specially commissioned by the, uh, for the Adivar Pupeta Ashram was being sculptured in Mysore. The installation ceremony of this Murti statue was scheduled to take place immediately after the Sapana of the Shivalinga on uh, 25th February 1962, i.e. Mahashivaratri night. On the night of 24th February 1962, i.e. the night uh, previous to the installation, Sri Swamiji was sitting along uh, in the Dhyana Mandir, when Bhavani, another name for Parvati, appeared before him and demanded that the two blood sacrifices, that two blood sacrifices be performed to propitiate her during the installation ceremony, but Sri Swamiji promptly refused. Reverently, though firmly, he informed the mother that a blood sacrifice was not acceptable to him, and hence no blood sacrifice would be performed in the pre within the precincts of the ashram. At this, Mother Bhavani simply smiled and vanished. As subsequent events will show, the mother was determined to have her own way in spite of the objections of her recalcitrant son. On the day of the installation ceremony, i.e. Mahashivaratri day of 1962, people began arriving in Adivara Pupeta from early morning onwards and as the day wore on, a vast multitude had congregated at the ashram. At about 4 p.m. in the afternoon, a stout sadhu arrived with his party to witness the installation ceremony. Kirtan or devotional singing was going on at the time and a large number of devotees lost to the outer world in Bhava Samadhi were dancing ecstatically to the beat of the devotional music. The sadhu observed all this for some time and then announced with a sneer to all who would care to listen that these people were, who were supposedly in Bhava, Bhava Samadhi were in fact humbugs and were faking this condition to attract attention to themselves. To prove his point the, more emphatically, the sadhu struck the man nearest to him with one of his wooden sandals. By this somewhat drastic action, the sadhu hoped to deflate the person and thereby expose what he assumed to be mere pre pretense on his part. Unfortunately for the sadhu, the man he struck happened to be Hanuman in Hanuman Baba. This man 
immediately snatched the same wooden sandal from the sadhu's hand and retaliated by stri striking the sadhu uh, a resounding crack on the head with such tremendous force that the uh, sadhu's head split open and he fell unconscious to the ground this caused an in immediate commotion as people crowded around to see what had happened the sadhu was somehow extricated from the crowd and carried in that unconscious state to sri swami ji blood was pouring from the sadhu's head in a copious stream and as soon as swami ji saw the sadhu he recalled bhavani's demand for blood sacrifice he was rather upset and remonstrated with the mother saying i told you there should be no blood sacrifice in the ashram and now look what you have done sri swami ji then liberally applied consecrated vibhuti to the wound tightly bound up the sadhu's head this saved the sadhu's life and after some time he regained consciousness later that night as sri swami ji sat alone in the dhyana mandir bhavani appeared again before him and told him to say that she was uh, told him that uh, she was thirsty and that she wanted blood to con quench her thirst have you haven't you had enough as sri swami ji see how much blood that poor man lost no said uh, bhavani only half my thirst has been quenched i want more blood in that case said sri swami ji i will give all the blood you want please leave the devotee alone he then extended his left hand bhavani bit into the left forearm and with great relish started sucking the blood that began to flow out immediately as it approached midnight sri swami ji requested bhavani to let him go as the time for the installation ceremonies was approaching thereupon bhavani smiled and blessing her yogi son she disappeared the unique and mysterious circumstances attendant on the installation of the shivalinga and the murti of mother parvati which have been related above are a clear proof that shankara bhagwan and bhavani are manifest in the dhyana mandir as living presences therefore to obtain darshan of the dhyana mandir uh, and the deities installed therein is in itself a great blessing